algorithm. Oh, yay, groans. That's what I wanted. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Algorithm and Rhymes, or Algorithms and Rhymes. My name is Nikki Semmelroth. Some of you already know this. I used to be an orchestra teacher um, back in the dark days. Um, now I'm a software developer, and I head up the intern program here at Clearwater Analytics. So as we were getting to know last summer's interns, uh, I noticed that probably about half of them played an instrument. I was pleased about this, but not terribly surprised. In my experience, musicians tend to be highly academic. Uh, in school, uh, most of my musician colleagues were in advanced classes. And it turns out musical training can actually change the brain in ways that promote greater academic success. But that's not terribly obvious, right? Why would playing a flute actually make you better at reading or better at math? Well, do you guys remember No Child Left Behind? Maybe this group is too young. <laughs> so this is going to date me. I actually did my student teaching at Bora High School in 2002. This was just a year after No Child Left Behind was signed into law. It was a bipartisan effort back when those were actually a thing. And it was aimed at improving our schools by heavily weighing funding on reading and math scores. So in order to make the grade, in, in other words, in order for schools to get their funding, they many felt like they had to increase the amount of time spent on these subjects. And because there's only so many hours in a school day, they ended up taking some of them, I shouldn't say all of them, but some of them ended up taking away from specials like physical education, the arts, music. So when I entered the world of music education, it was at a time of a lot of heightened uh, defensiveness. And so this kind of blossomed into actually a whole bunch of music education research. I thought this was normal. Uh, I just thought everyone had been researching these things for a long time. But actually, when I went back and did my research for this presentation, I found that a lot of these um, studies actually started around the early 2000s and kind of went from there. So thanks, No Child Left Behind. All right. <laughs> Ouch. I should mention that while being a vocalist is awesome, um, all the research that I looked into was actually uh, looking into instrumental um, musical training. So just going to clarify that part. All right, so you play an instrument. What's the big deal? Well, it is kind of a big deal. There's a lot going on here. So first, there has to be some sort of input. This is usually done through the eyes. Um, but it can also be done through memory recall. Uh, from that, the body has to do something with the input. And chances are your right hand is probably going to be doing something completely different than your left hand. While this is happening, you're also pulling in auditory input as well and possibly having to make adjustments as necessary, like this young man often has to do. And oh, don't forget about the whole space-time continuum thing, which means that you have to play within a regimented um, time beat. So an analogy, it might be like if your English teacher asked you to read a paragraph, um, but then she says, oh, but you have to read it in exactly 90 seconds. And cut this loaf of bread with your right hand. Oh, and type out these words with your left hand, right? There's a lot going on here. So what does this have to do with software development? Well, I went online and I pulled up a couple dozen articles that actually outline the top qualities that they're looking for in a software developer. I ordered, organized them into broad categories, put them into this pretty little word cloud. Um, but I also kind of pulled out the really the top five. Uh, and they look like this technical skills. So that's a big one, right? You have to actually know how to code. You have to do know some languages, some technologies, that type of thing. 
Executive functions, that's another big one, and we will get into what that means if you're not familiar with executive functioning. Ability to learn quickly, our industry is constantly changing, and you have to be able to keep up. It's actually one of the reasons why I like this job. Communication skills are a must, at least around Clearwater. Um, I suppose maybe if you work in a bubble. Uh, and being a team player as well. Uh, but a lot of tech companies outline these as kind of their number one things. I'm going to address all of these today except for technical skills because as much as I would like musical training to help me learn like TypeScript, it just is not. So let's look at executive functions. So musical training has been shown to has been linked to strong executive functions. I first became familiar with executive functioning because I know some children that actually struggle with it. Struggles can look like this. They might have difficulty prioritizing tasks. They often forget what they just heard or they just read, their working memory. Um, they have a hard time remembering and or following multi-step directions. They have a hard time organizing their thoughts and often can't keep track of their things. They have bad time, in, time management. Um, so somebody that struggles with executive functioning may know that they need to get from point A to point E, but they have a really hard time coming up with the steps in between and possibly executing those steps. So in technical terms, that's, like I said, we've got your working memory. This is the memory of the things that are kind of right in front of you in order to do your job. Um, it really helps with your paying attention and your ability to problem solve. Cognitive flexibility, you're doing this one thing and then you kind of have to shift gears and kind of concurrently do these two things together. That's a, that's a really big part of our jobs as QAs, software developers, um, product owners even. Self-control, setting priorities, and doing all those things that maybe need to be done, but you don't really want to do it. Uh, OK, so I have a son that is very good at executive functioning. So I'm loading them up in the car. I'm like, you got your backpack. You got your lunchbox. Good, let's go. Got to get out of here. And so we're driving, like pulling out of the driveway. And he's like, stop, mom. And he runs out of the car. and he. <laughs> He goes inside and he comes back with like half a dozen things that like I didn't mention. He's got like his violin for orchestra class and his permission slip and his soccer bag. And, uh, it's not because he has like a better actual memory than I do, but he's much better at looking at his day at a whole. He can think about the snapshot of his day and not just the things that he needs to do, but the tools that he needs to, to accomplish those tasks. So that's strong executive functioning. Executive functioning, not surprisingly, has actually been, um, has a greater impact on academic success than intelligence. All right, there are a lot of studies that actually link musical training to strong executive function skills. I'm gonna, instead of going over a whole bunch of them, I'm actually gonna dive into one of these studies just to give you an idea of the things that they were looking for and how they looked at them. So this study took 30 adults, healthy, right-handed, monolingual English-speaking adults ages 18 to 35. 15 of them were non-musicians, the other half were musicians that had started playing um, around the age of nine and there was no significant differences in their gender, age, or IQ. We also have children, 27 of them, ages 9 through 10. 12 of them not musically trained. 15 of them were musically trained and had been playing for at least two years. Um, they started playing at an average age of five. So those are our subjects. And let's look at the tests that they did. So there's this test for cognitive flexibility. Well. Uh, so let me give you an idea of the warm-up test. So they had this letter fluency test, and they said, 
in this span of time, tell me all the words that you can think of that start with the letter B. Go. Uh, and then they did a category fluency test where they said, okay, give me, give me all the farm animals that you can think of. Go. Uh, well, the cognitive flexibility part comes in where they say, all right, I'm going to give you two categories, and I want you to simultaneously give me things in that category. Farm animals and fruits, go. Uh, and so that is really testing their ability to switch tasks, right? Cogn their cognitive flexibility. So the musically trained children performed better than their untrained counterparts, and the musically trained adults performed significantly better. We've got working memory tests. This one was done through a digit span backwards test. So they were given a span of digits, give it to me backwards. Every test, that span got longer and longer. The musically trained children actually um, performed the same as their untrained counterparts, which was surprising because um, there, this test had been done a number of times and the, they had scored significantly higher, but science. and then. Uh, the adults actually showed significant differences. And then there was a processing speed test uh, where they did coding subtests. So they had some codes that corresponded to random uh, numbers, and you just had to kind of randomly decode them. Um, children showed significant differences, and the adults showed um, differences that trended towards significance. So these were the behavioral results, right? The results that you can record from how they performed. Uh, but in this particular test, they actually also did brain scans on the children as they were performing these tasks. And this is where it really gets good. So during the task switching task, task the musically trained children show greater activation in the executive functioning regions of the brain. So while the untrained children were kind of bouncing to the parts of their brain that they needed for the task at hand, the musically trained children, their brains were just lighting up and they were using greater regions of the brain and they were using their brain all at the same time. So they were able to see some marked differences there in the, the way that they were actually solving these problems. Now, because we are all critical thinkers, especially Quincy, um, <laughs> we understand that correlation does not necessarily mean causation. Um, so that is why I refrain from making any conclusions on my own, and I really just rely on the conclusions from the experts themselves. This study was done in 2014, four authors, two from Harvard, one from Ch Boston Children's Hospital, and another from UCLA. And their conclusion was that musically trained children and adults did show enhanced performance on executive functioning tasks. Now, the amount of studies out there are so vast. Um, so if you have any questions about this, I highly recommend it is, it's, it's actually really fun um, to look into some of these studies. A lot of them, especially if you Google um, musical training neurology, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that you're just going to be like, I don't know what any of this means. But uh, it's really fun to look at the discussion points and then the conclusion points of them. Uh, I was able to, this one, for example, um, did say, OK, well, we didn't see differences in this thing, but we did see differences here. And this, we weren't strong enough, or this was, or whatever, right? So executive functions. Ability to learn quickly. Now, if we're going to dabble in the world of neuroscience, what we really need to talk about is brain plasticity. So there are three main times in your life where you have a lot of brain plasticity. When you're a child and you're learning all the new things and you're creating all the new neural networks, you have a lot of brain plasticity. If you incur a brain injury and you lose a bunch of uh, brain function, again, lots of brain plasticity going on there. And then when you're an adult and you learn a new thing, but not just learn a new thing, but actually create all the new neural networks in order to keep it in your long-term memory, that's an, another example of brain plasticity. So it has been found that musical training has an impact on brain plasticity. This study 
let's dive into another one. This one was really seeking to tackle um, the whole nature versus nurture question. Um, this was a 15-month study uh, supported by the National Science Foundation. And it took two groups of 15 children. They were all right-handed, monolingual, closely matched for age, gender, and socioeconomic status. That is a big one. Uh, neither groups had prior musical training. They were a mean age of six with a standard deviation of a year. And oh, one of uh, 15 of them just kind of went about their everyday lives for the next 15 months. And uh, the other half started taking keyboard lessons. So for a little over a year. Uh, they conducted a series of tests before and after, and they were able to find that the musically trained children actually showed greater improvements in their motor ability as well as their auditory skills. Uh, but they also were able to see some structural brain changes. I didn't actually show the pictures of them because they're like, I don't know, they're not that exciting. Um, <laughs> but they, they were able to see the structural brain changes in the parts of the brain that control both their motor skills and their auditory skills. And uh, this was kind of a big win because they actually felt like this really helped nail down some of the nurture side of the argument. Again, because I'm not a neurologist, I leave it to the experts to make the conclusions. And in this case, they also they found that it not only changed the brain, but also had an effect on their potential for their short-term learning. You can imagine children are really great subjects for these things, these types of tests. And neuroplasticity, really, we're talking about ability to learn here. All right, communication skills. This one's actually my favorite category. So musical training, this, this is actually the strongest category out of all of them, I think. Uh, and, and I was surprised. I did, not, I did not realize there was such a wealth of research to, to really show that musical training can actually strengthen your ability to process communication. Uh, I found this really great literature review. It was published in 2015 in the Handbook of Clinical Neurology. It was by Krauss and Slater from Northwestern University. And uh, for those that don't know what a literature review is, you, you're basically taking uh, a bunch of sources and studies, and uh, you, you're, you're seeking to really synthesize and summarize uh, what's actually going on here. Um, so they wanted to look at how musical training affects the sensory system, and their conclusion was that it has profound effects on it. They actually uh, also, they took, uh, just to give you an idea, this literature review looked at hundreds of different sources and studies. So in it, it kind of talks about the brainstem response to speech. So if if you, you may know that the brainstem is actually responsible for our most primitive functions, so breathing, heartbeat, your brainstem is responsible for that. But also, um, it's responsible for the flow of messages between your brain and the rest of your body. If you look at the brainstem response um, of a language impaired child compared to a normal adult, and then also the brainstem response of the musician, you can see that their, their uh, brainstem is actually much more, it has a greater reaction to it. And this actually has an impact on your ability to encode language. So what does this mean? Um, this actually means that a greater brainstem response could mean that you can process sounds ease, more easily, especially in like a loud classroom or possibly a loud team room. I don't know if those exist, just saying if it's possible. Um, it also helps us interpret the more subtle nuances of language. So maybe you... Um, Maybe you're a little bit better at detecting if somebody is frustrated or 
sad or um, excited about something than the person next to you. Um, and because of that, it actually helps to better understand emotions and increases your ability for social bonding. There was another article that was really great that highlighted how musical training lends itself not only in both auditory processing, but it's actually the auditory processing and reading skills are so closely tied that if you have a greater brainstem response to um, sounds and language, then it's actually going to come through in your reading skills as well. This is really great because not only have we found that something like musical training can enhance your um, ability to process language, but also um, it can really help with children that have difficulties in these areas, or adults, um, because they have actually, this line of research actually caused people to discover that a substantial portion of children with reading problems actually have auditory processing defects. It's not intuitive. The cool thing is that um, the amount of time that you have musical training actually matters. So they took some adults and they checked out their signal to noise ratio, um, their responses in their brain, signal to noise. And zero years was um, about half that of those that had one to five years of musical training and, uh, and then even less than those with six to 11 years. So music can play a, an important role in promoting social development, interpersonal skills, and community building. An interesting fact, um, how many in here are bilingual, just out of curiosity? Oh, interesting fact is that um, a lot of the same uh, benefits that bilingual folks experience, um, musical training also, people with musical training also get those same benefits. Um, and in addition to the kind of immediate benefits that we're talking about, that also has some long-term benefits like um, later onset of dementia. All right, and then team player. So this one's kind of intuitive, right? Like sports, the amount of collaboration in, um, and team trust that you have to have as at least an ensemble musician um, is pretty significant. The Kronos Quartet, I don't know if any of you have heard of them. They've been around for about 40 years. And they rendered a beautiful video that, um, where they are represented as a series of dots um, only when they play, though. So when they're not playing and their instrument is not uh, making sounds, then they are gone. And then they appear as soon as their music uh, instrument makes a sound. And it was really designed to create um, an illustration of a musician's ecosystem. available with and without the artist's commentary. Um, the four quartet players actually are talking about what it means to play in, an or, uh, in a quartet, and I wanted to show you all of it, but it was too long for me to show the whole thing. Um, but uh, they really talk about how intimate and delicate the conversation is in a string quartet. The first violin, the first violinist talks about how he can practice his part just and play it just the way that he wants to play it. But the thing that he really needs to practice is how to be flexible and how to be responsive to his surroundings because that's actually the hard part and that's actually the more valuable part. Uh, the cellist talks about how every note that she plays is really dependent on the note that was played just before her because, again, that has such a strong impact on how she does things. Um, 
So I really encourage it. It's a really beautiful video with, with their commentary as well. Um, some of the best teams actually act like musicians. Uh, they switch chairs and roles often. They play their part in the midst of a whole. They don't compare because they know that there will be a variety of skills and abilities, and they are constantly anticipating each other's needs. So, okay, just because musicians are good at what they do, uh, does that necessarily mean that it transfers over into their everyday lives? Well, it kinda does. <laughs> Um, the brain is not an island by any means, um, and there's this thing called far transfer. I don't know if you've heard of it, but you've got your musical instrument training, and then you've got the immediate things that benefit from that. So that's the actual playing of the instrument, right? Your listening skills, your fine motor skills, that type of thing. Um, but our brains are not islands, and they don't function as such. Um, so there's it. It has an impact on things like our uh, working memory, our social skills, um, our executive functions. So just out of curiosity, um, raise your hand if you have any prior musical training. Yeah. <laughs> um, raise your hand if you played your instrument for at least two years. Five, 10, 20? Nice. <laughs> um, well, here are some interesting statistics for you. Only about 20% of the US population plays an instrument from ages 18 to 24. And after about 25, it drops down to about 10%. And then I think it kind of dips out around like 75 um, at 6%. Uh, so, I'm sure you've probably noticed that the ratios in this room are a, a little bit different than, than the general public. <laughs> so you, you, know, you might kind of think about that. I'm not saying that musical training is a magical potion. Is it going to turn you into a little mini Einstein? Absolutely not. No more than exposing your child to Mozart in the womb is gonna make them a little mini genius. We wish, right? That'd be such an easy solution. Um, but I can tell you some things that musical training can do. Um, it's probably gonna sharpen your brain and increase your ability to learn new things. It could potentially help with the communication in both your professional and personal life. Um, and playing a musical instrument has actually been shown to have a number of physical benefits. It will relieve stress, it actually lowers blood pressure, and it has been shown to even boost the immune system. So if you're wondering whether or not you should dish out that $30 a month to, for your son to start trombone, I would say you absolutely should. <laughs> um, if you have a cello sitting in your closet that's been sitting there since high school, you should dig that thing out. Let me know, we can do some duets. Um, and if you're trying to advance your career um, by knocking out eight hours of code on the workday and then going home and knocking out two to three more hours of code, I really encourage you to maybe take it a different direction, maybe pick up that instrument that you've always wanted to learn um, because it could benefit you in ways that you were not expecting. All right, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so um, the question is, um, is there a window where, um, where children benefit more greatly um, to learn their instrument? And actually, the number that I have heard is age seven. Um, I don't know 
Uh, I don't know why. I don't know what's going on in the development uh, for that to happen. But they actually, all those things that we had talked about, that greater executive functioning, the auditory responses, all of that is significantly greater if you start before, I think it's around six or seven. Um, so yeah, if your kids are over six or seven, you, you blew your shot, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just give up. <laughs> Yeah. Um, does the instrument matter? No. Uh, no. The um, I, you know what? Can so, oh, I'm sorry. The question was, does the instrument matter? I, I, you know, I didn't see anything. I shouldn't say no because I didn't see anything that would indicate that the instrument matters. Um, most of the studies that I was looking at, you know, like that one, they had the kids play the keyboard. It's a pretty easily accessible instrument. Um, and it's, it's one of, I don't want to say it's an easy instrument to play, but it's definitely easier than others. Um, so, uh, so I don't think it, the instrument matters. That's just my guess, educated guess. Yeah? Um, kind of a follow-up to the prior question. Uh, do you know of any research about people learning to play an instrument starting in their 30s or 40s or 50s? Yeah. Um, so... Uh, it, uh, the question was, is there any research about um, adults learning to play an instrument starting in the, um, maybe in their 30s or 40s? I was going to say old age, but that's not. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the, the research that I read, um, and, and I, you know, I only showed you guys three studies. I probably read like 25 of them. So I'm just trying to kind of summarize all of these studies that I read. But um, it really doesn't matter. So if we're not talking about, um, you know, that, that, that crucial ch child age, like if you're learning as an adult, really the thing that matters the most is the years of study. Because it is one of those things where the, the more years you have, the greater the benefits are. Yeah. Yeah, uh, is this limited to instruments or also to choral? So I did see some studies. There was this one, and I need to put it, uh, by the way, I have this resources page. Um, and I'll, I'll try to add some, some more cool studies on here. There was one that I looked at that was huge. Um, it, it involved like 700 um, uh, subjects, I guess you would say. And, and they were comparing. Um, instrumentalists, I'm trying to remember, uh, vocalists, theater folks, they're an unruly group, and sports uh, athletes, and, and then a control group. And um, it was such a big study, and the things that they were, it just was not conclusive enough for me. Um, and so so yeah, there, there weren't many that I saw that actually were just looking at, at vocalists. Um, but I, I have seen that you know, the act of reading music um, does have some benefits, because it is very similar to reading another language. I, I, should, I also want to should tell you about this slide that I had in here but took out. But now here I am telling you about it. Um, you'll see all sorts of junk out there. Um, there's this really terrible graph that's going around where they took um, the results from the College Board of Education, the SAT results, and they're like, all right, here's, um, here's, here's students with musical training, and here's their SAT results, and then here's students that don't have four years of musical training. And so they're trying to use that as like a conclusion, like, look at how much better they're doing. Clearly, it's the musical training. You know, and that's, that's just junk, right? Like, th there is no way to come to any conclusions about SAT results just because they have four years of musical training. Um, so, so definitely, a, as you're out there you know, looking at things, be sure to look at it with a very cautious eye, because there's a whole bunch of people that are saying some ridiculous, making some ridiculous conclusions. Because I think we can probably all understand that, well, um, affluence is a thing, right? Um, 
children are much more likely to play an instrument if they are in affluent, um, if they are in an, if come from an affluent family, uh, because simply the schools can't provide instruments for everyone, so a lot of people have to buy them nowadays or rent them. Um, socioeconomic status of parents. I didn't look at anything that didn't have a, a nod to equal socioeconomic status because that is a huge thing. And for those of you that don't know, socioeconomic status looks at family income, but then also education levels of, of parents um, because that can have a great impact on the way that children are um, brought up and then other factors as well. Any other questions? These are good questions. Yeah. Oh. Was, oh, the brainstem response? Oh, signal to noise ratio? Yeah, what does that mean? Okay, so you're getting noise, um, you're hearing things, right? We hear things all day long. Um, only some of those things actually produce a signal to your brain. Um, so we can all probably think of the person that's like, just selectively responds to you when, <laughs> when you're talking to them, or just some mm-hmm's, right? They're, you're, you're talking to them, but they're not, there's no signal happening there. <laughs> um, so this is, the signal to noise ratio is like, um, what kind of brain signals are being sent out in relation to the amount of noise that's coming in? What, um, your brain's ability to sift through those things and, and kind of glean out the important things. Yeah? Is there a distinction between teachers who are trained by an instructor as opposed to like self-taught? Uh, no, that's interesting. Um, I did not find anything about that. Um, but I do have to say, uh, that's actually one of the reasons that I was a little bit disenchanted as an orchestra teacher. Um, because we have this idea that musicians are like, oh, you have to, you have to go to this um, instructor, you have to go to this class, and you have to read this music, and, and when you do this, you will be up on a pedestal, and musicians are special, and musicians are unique, and they, they do these amazing things, and I always felt like, no, anybody can be a musician. It's not something special. We shouldn't think of it like it's something special. We should think of it like it's an everyday thing that we all go home and play our instruments. And some of us will play them really well. And some of us will play it really crappy. But it doesn't matter because we are enjoying ourselves. And it's important to our human souls, right? And so I, that was one of the things. So uh, I would say, from my personal experience, that like I would think self-taught musicians are actually like maybe even a notch above, right? Because <laughs> they're just doing it. They're not, uh, I don't know. Some instruments lend itself easier, right? Like how many self-taught guitarists are there? Probably way more than self-taught violinists. Um, but yeah, there, I didn't see anything in my research about that. But thanks for asking that question so I could get on my soapbox. <laughs> Any last questions? All right, thanks so much, guys, for coming.